Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode six of the Weird, Freaky Brain Science of Drugs. For those of you that have followed along this far, that's really impressive. You are invested. But for those of you who have not seen episode one yet, I would encourage you to please close this video and go to episode one. Watch that first before the remaining episodes. So today's weird, freaky brain chemical is called anandamide. Ananda is the Sanskrit word for bliss. The guy who discovered this thought that he discovered the bliss molecule. And that makes a lot of sense to me. So, THC is the drug that dresses up as anandamide. In order for THC to get into the brain, it dresses up as anandamide, floods the gap, which runs the risk of our anandamide receptors, or our anandamide factories shutting down, and it plugs into anandamide receptors, which is the risk of THC and anandamide tolerance. We know these three things. But what does anandamide do? What does it feel like? So, based on what you may have heard from other people, what does it feel like to get stoned? What are some adjectives that you would use to help describe the feeling of getting stoned? The adjectives that you just thought of are probably something like this. Feeling blissful, feeling relaxed, feeling chill. And then 20 minutes later, getting the munchies, right? Anandamide has a few stages of life where it's crucially important. Other than these few stages of life, we don't have a huge need for big doses of anandamide. So if we think of our brain on an evolutionary time scale and we go back to the days of monkeys, there are a few things that monkeys like to do. They like to swing through the trees. They like to eat their bananas and berries. They like to groom each other. They like to make new monkeys. And so now monkey mama's pregnant. Now that monkey mama is pregnant, if she were to t spend her days swinging through the trees, the nutrition that she's getting from her bananas and berries would be going right to her muscles instead of to her perfect little parasite. So now her brain is flooding her with anandamide so that she can be blissful about being relaxed and chill and hanging out at the base of the tree so the monkey daddy brings her bananas and berries. And every 20 minutes she's getting hungry so that little monkey baby has the chance to thrive. Now we zoom to any hospital in Colorado today. Baby's born. Baby's born screaming and crying and freaking out in ultra panic mode and doesn't yet have the ability to trust that their next meal is coming. What is baby's first pleasurable experience? Latching on. Breastfeeding. Baby was screaming and crying and freaking out. How does baby look now? Blissful and relaxed and chill. And 20 minutes later, Baby's crying again because baby's hungry, right? This anandamide really helps us develop in utero and as an infants. There, anandamide can be found in breast milk, and there are even studies to suggest that uh, the anandamide can be released, can be triggered by the act of suckling. So a baby-fed formula from a bottle even has the chance to experience the stonedness of anandamide. Now, there are evolutionary biologists who believe that anandamide is one of the reasons that mammals have become so successful, right? That we as humans have become so successful because shrimp don't get pregnant and don't get anandamide. And iguanas don't get pregnant and don't get anandamide. And blue jays don't get pregnant and don't get anandamide. It's just us weird, freaky mammals that get pregnant and get anandamide. There's an amazing relationship between anandamide and pregnancy. For some reason, the human body interprets anandamide to be a female hormone. So, 
if a male hormone and a female hormone are battling it out, who's going to win? Yes, the female hormone, every time, forever. Please learn it now, right? The risk for the teenager is specific here. The risk for the teenager during this awkward, strange, developmental period called puberty, if we're ingesting something that is dressing up as a female hormone, and the female hormone and the male hormone are competing with each other, and the male hormone loses, what can that do to a young man who's experiencing puberty? It runs the risk of that puberty just being stunted, right? What about for the young lady? When does a young lady need the highest levels of female hormone? And if this young lady is experiencing higher levels of female hormone for the other 28 days, what is she going to experience? What we see is people being ultra mega cranky so much of the time. There's a risk for the teenager, but the risk for the teenager can get a lot deeper than this. The risk for the teenager largely has to do with coping skills, right? This is a fluffy therapeutic term, and we know what these things are, and we know what they do and when to use them. The risk for the teenager is like this. We know that the, that the brain finishes its development by the age of 25, 25 to 26-ish, right? We as adults, we have a responsibility to be very careful about this messaging I'm about to give you. When an adult is talking to a teenager and saying, you shouldn't be blazing because your brain's not developed yet, it's really insulting. The teenager really has the chance to absorb that message as condescending. By the time a teenager is 15, the intelligence part of their brain is really well cooked really well formed and for those of you that are parents or teachers or counselors or mentors out there you see this all the time and the way that that 16 year old has the ability to like lawyer up on you with their arguments and how sound and specific they really are i'm not here to suggest that if a teen uses cannabis that they're going to get stupid the risk is different than that there's another part of the brain that's under major and rapid development between the ages of 15 and 25. And it's the part of the brain that's trained by these, by the coping skills. Some of the healthiest people in the world might have 15 of these coping skills that they practice regularly, that they use often, that live in their back pocket. The risk for the teenager is more like this. Let's say that I come home from school today and I am angry and I'm so upset because that one teacher gave me an F on that assignment. And I come home from school and I tell my uncle about it. My uncle says, dude, I'm mad. You're mad. Let's go to the basement and take care of it. And we do. And we go down to the basement and like <sighs> suddenly and magically all of that anger that I was experiencing, I don't have to notice it and I don't have to sit with it. And it's not a part of me. It's a part from me briefly. And I'm coping with it. And it's so much less work than actually going to soccer practice or talking to a trusted friend or writing in my journal or writing a song or seeking a mentor or talking to a therapist or any of the thousand things that I could do to cope with this in a sustainable way. And then the next week, I come home from school and I'm feeling sad and lonely and rejected because he said no to prom. And I come home from school and I tell my cousin about it. My cousin's like, dude, I'm sad. You're sad. Let's go to the basement and take care of it. And we do. We go to the basement and suddenly and magically all of that loneliness and rejection that I was experiencing, I don't have to notice it. And I don't have to sit with it. And it's not a part of me. It's a part from me briefly and I'm coping with it. And now I'm training that part of my brain to understand that this is the quickest and easiest way to cope. And it runs the risk of becoming my favorite coping skill. And it runs, if it becomes my favorite coping skill, 
it runs the risk of becoming my one and only coping skill. If someone finds themselves in a position of having one coping skill, their relationship with that coping skill is a relationship of dependence. It's like saying, without that one thing, without that thing that lives outside of me, without that one coping strategy, I am useless. This is moot. I literally can't even. Someone finds themselves in a position of having one coping skill, then this is no longer a drug talk. If someone finds themselves in a position of having one coping skill, their relationship to that coping skill is a relationship of dependence. And this is no longer a drug talk. This one coping skill could be anything. It could be an unhealthy relationship with a bucket of KFC or an unhealthy relationship with my Xbox or an unhealthy relationship with unhealthy relationships or an unhealthy relationship with cutting and self-harm in a razor blade or an unhealthy relationship with substances, including alcohol. And if someone finds themselves in a position of having one coping skill, they're in a position of dependence. Between the ages of 15 and 25, the primary duty of the teenager should be to be a collector of coping skills. I give this presentation often in high schools. And every time I give it, I assume that there's someone that hears it that says, Hey, Colt, I appreciate all of this info, but substances are my destiny. And I'm going to be using. And I promise you that I respect that. But I ask all of our teens to consider two magic numbers before they make the choice to use. And the first magic number is 21. And if we're talking about drugs, why is 21 a magic number? At least here in Colorado, when someone turns 21, on their 21st birthday, they suddenly and magically now have the right to make that choice. As long as someone's using responsibly and they're 21 or older, they have the right to make that choice. And as long as they're using responsibly, they can drink and blaze all day and all night and nobody can say anything about it. As long as that person is using responsibly, they can pour Jack Daniels on their breakfast cannabis nuggets and nobody can say anything. But I have to say, as long as they're using responsibly. And I have to say it that way because we have figured out that it's cheaper. It's more cost effective. It's more affordable for a person to charter a helicopter and a pilot for the average rate of $1,600 an hour. To have the helicopter and pilot fly that person to the bar. To have the helicopter and pilot hover above the bar for four hours while they listen to the band play and rack up a $1,000 bar tab and have the helicopter and pilot fly them back home than it is to get arrested for drunk driving. In the state of Colorado, it takes ten dollars to $12,000 for a person to work their way through their first DUI charge, and it takes one or two years for a person to work their way through their first DUI charge. And during that period of time, while that person is working their way through their DUI charge, that person's right to choose if they're going to drink or blaze is taken from them, and they don't have the right to make that choice. So, as long as someone waits until they're 21, the consequences just change, as long as they're using responsibly. But I will get on my hands and knees and I will beg all day and night for the teenager that is actually considering substance use to wait until they're 25. We talked about how the brain's fully developed at 25 and between the ages of 15 and 25, this part of the brain's under major, crazy, rapid development. If a person is over the age of 25, and they have 15 of these coping skills that they practice regularly that they know work for them, I don't really care if one of those is a joint. And I don't really care because if that person gets onto an airplane and they start having a full-blown panic attack and they can't whip out their bong to treat their anxiety, <clears throat> there's 14 others that live in that person's back pocket that they practice regularly. They're going to help soothe that person during the flight. I'm not really concerned about that person. If someone can wait until they're 25 for their first use, their chances of unlocking the disease of addiction or unlocking a substance use disorder drastically drop. Not to zero, but drastically drop. The risk for the teenager is different. I'm grateful for your time, folks.